different than it is now because at the time uh, the Nepali government only allowed one expedition on the mountain at a time. So that's it. There was just us for Everest. There was a New Zealand team with the son of Sir Edmund Hillary attempting to do the peak beside it, Lose. So that's it. Two expeditions in base camp. There was a Spanish expedition that was attempting the west ridge of Everest, not on our line, and they were climbing up to the Lola, the call between uh, the mountain to the left of Everest and Everest, and then they were going to try to climb Everest by the west ridge. So we had three expeditions on the mountain, but none of us interfering with each other. And uh, this is a picture taken from about, I don't know, five miles away, four miles away. Base camp located in the lower left-hand corner. Everest in the background at 29,000. Nupsake to the right at about 26,000 or 27,000. You can't see Lotse, which is hidden behind the west ridge of Nupsake. And those three peaks form a huge bowl that collects snow, and it forms a glacier that comes down. And we climbed up nine miles of glacier hiking to establish base camp here. And then our route was to go up the normal route of Everest to the base, the southwest base, and try to climb the southwest base. That was the plan. Here's our team in base camp. At 30 Sherpas, uh, certain base camp personnel, cooks, cooks assistants, liaison officers, 67 people in all, 23 Canadians. Food and alcohol laid out on the table as an offering to the spirit of, of Shomalongu, Mother Goddess. And once that was completed, we got down to the task of uh, trying to climb the mountain. Peter Spear was our base camp manager, the guy in the yellow shirt. He was a high school principal, so perfectly trained to deal with a bunch of adults trying to climb Everest from Calgary. And um, he did an excellent job. Most of the people you'll see wearing red underwear are going to be the climbers, whose job it was to try to get to the top. Jim Elzinga, Don Searle, checking all the options systems. We lost a good percentage of our bottles because the sealant used after they were pressurized to 5,000 PSI leaked. And so we didn't have the full contingent of oxygen we planned to have. Uh, geez, that's Gordon Smith and Dave Reed checking all the high altitude the stoves, which we'd use to melt snow and ice to get liquid. Very important. No, not Dave, our CBC reporter, Blair Griffiths, whose job it was to record the expedition for CBC and ABC, but had a secondary role of maintaining communications on the expedition. Good man, a really kind man. But we all had the same gear. Uh, it was state of the art at the time, now it would be old fashioned, you wouldn't even look twice at it. But uh, it was pretty expensive when you outfitted 67 people. Backpacks, ice assets, sleeping bags, watches, sunglasses, crampons, down parkas. Uh, the state of the art gear, best example would be these Colflak boots. They just come out the year before, lightweight, half the weight of leather boots, twice as warm, warm when they're wet. And we all were outfitted with the best gear that money could buy. And um, that was good. That was good. Gear wasn't going to be the issue. We were planning on doing the Southwest Face. So we had special tents created that could be set up on platforms that we would carry up and anchor to the face. And that's what they look like. I know you're thinking they look like a chuck wagon. That's because they were designed here in Calgary. And they, and they were made out of ballistic nylon, bulletproof nylon. I did have something to say about the design, but and I did keep one after the expedition was over. Uh, then, while that was going on, uh, we were working with the Sherpas, because only a third of them spoke English, trying to clarify what the operating procedures would be higher up on the mountain. And then a handful of us worked on finding a route through the icefall. So now this is something that another enterprise takes care of. They set up the icefall and you pay a fee every time you go through it. Back then, that wasn't being done. You had to set up a way to get through the ice fall. So it's about 2,000 vertical feet over a linear distance of about 4,000 feet. Tens of thousands of crevasses and sracks. You've heard it before. You know what it's like. It's the most dangerous part of the whole mountain. There's a couple of people coming out at the bottom just to give you a, a perspective of the size. And then um, once the road was set up to get to Camp 1, nothing there, but we would establish Camp 1, then we get up each morning at 1.30 to carry gear through the ice fall. Why so early? Because during the night when it was the coldest, the glacier had moved the least amount. That was the theory, and supposedly safer. Well, there was no safe stuff going on in the ice fall, as time would, would show. 
This is just an idea of what a standard day in the ice fall looks like. This is the area where we established Camp 1 in 19,200 feet. You can see Lhotse, Sister Peak to Everest in the background, Nuxe looming above us to the right, Everest looming above us to the left. We wouldn't set up tents because we're not going to stay there yet. We're not acclimated well enough, so we would dump the gear into a pit, cover it with a tarp, descend back down to base camp, get some food, get some sleep, get up again the next morning at 1.30 a.m. Wrong one, sorry. And try again. Is it going to work? Get up at 1.30 and do the same thing. One hour reconnaissance from 1.30 to 2.30. Two of us would set off. By 2.30, if it looked like it was safe, relatively, we'd radio for the main team to come. They'd leave base camp carrying about a 35 to a 45 or 50 pound load, depending on how you were feeling that day. Uh, moved by headlamp. Through the, through the glacier, along fixed rope, and along the ladders that we created in the days before. Uh, it's kind of hard explaining to people that haven't been to altitude, and most of you that are climbers probably know what that's like. Headache, nausea, lack of appetite. It feels like you got a hangover, your joints ache. And then on top of that, you're moving in darkness, your orientation's a bit off, and uh, you got you got a heavy load to carry. So the novelty, I guess what I'm trying to say, wears off pretty quick. In the first few days, yeah, oh, I'm on Everest, I'm an Everest climber, blah, blah, blah. And then within a few days, you're realizing that this is just a hard, dangerous job. Because every day, gear's got to be carried up to the next campsite and back down again. And it turns into simple manual labor. And the exciting part of being on the sharp end of the rope just goes to a few people. And most of the time, it's just hard labor, freight hauling on the mountain. You tried to get to Camp 1 and get back long before the sun was high in the sky. You wanted to be there by 8.30, be done with your gear, storing it, and then be, be headed down before 9 a.m. This picture was taken at around 10.45, 10.30 one day when I was staying up there with the expedition leader, Bill March. And the temperatures were in the 30 degree range Celsius, 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. People think it can't get that hot at high altitude. It does. And it was terribly hot. The trick then was to get off the mountain as quickly as you could. Run down the mountain, areas where you climbed up ladders, you just clipped into a rappel line beside the ladder, shoot down the rappel line, slow down, unclip on the bottom, clip into the next one, keep running till you get to base camp. And at base camp, we all did the same thing. First of all, rehydrate. Secondly, treat your sunburn. Third, try to get past Peter Spear before you realize you were back in camp and hide out in your tent to get a bit of rest because you're getting burned out. If Peter Spear saw you, there was always work to do. Oh, Lori, I'm glad you're back. I need, that's how it usually start, which meant another two to three hours of work before you had a break to get something to eat. We get a break every five days where you'd spend a day in base camp and rest and recuperate. So I did something different than the rest and it's what I learned from the courses I would teach at Outward Bound. I think uh, at this stage I've taught 68 courses for Outward Bound from 1970 right up to last year. I still work for Outward Bound as an instructor. One of the things I learned is that if you take care of your appearance, if you shave, if you make sure your clothes are clean, if you keep your act together, people think you're more in control of your environment and your life. And so you can be a better leader when you look the part. So I made a point of shaving each day making sure I took a shower each day, no matter how hard it was, and I made sure I had clean clothes to wear each day. Not that it made me a better person, but it helped me maintain my attitude that I had a little bit of control in an environment where we really didn't have much control over what was going on around us. Then that day base camp would be over and we'd head back onto the mountain. Eventually we got acclimated enough to move up to and occupy the site of Camp 1. So this is Camp 1 at 19,200 feet, common appearance. Any campsite this time of year in Canada, in Western Canada, would look like that with all the snowfall. Of course, any experienced climber would go, what about avalanche hazard? And that's exactly the point. When it snows that much in so short a time, that's a 12-hour snowfall there, you're on the risk of avalanches, and we were no exception to the terrible statistic that the highest percentage of climbers killed in Himalayan climate are killed in avalanches. And so on the morning of uh, August the 31st, while a group of 12 of us were carrying gear from base camp to camp one, an avalanche came off the west ridge of Everest and buried five of our members. Two survived, three did die. The three men 
the three men killed were Sherpas. And of those three killed, we were only able to find the body of one man. We brought his body down. The other two would stay interned on the mountain for 24 years before their bodies popped out at the bottom of the glacier. How do we know? Because of the Sun Eyes two-piece climbing suits that they were wearing. Uh, that's how they were identified. So, unfortunately, we brought the body of the one Sherpa we were able to retrieve off the mountain. And in the days to come, that body was carried out to a village called Dugla, where Bill March, the expedition leader, and other key members of the team met the families of the three Sh Sherpas who had been killed. And it was while they were there, cremating the body, and trying to console the members of their family, that they got the news that another accident had happened on the mountainside. This time a section of the ice fall known as the Traverse, an area that had not moved in the previous couple of weeks. When it did shift that day, it shifted with such violence that it imploded on itself, collapsing straight down 20 feet. Five men were working in there, repairing bridges. Four of them survived miraculously, and one man did not. And that was Blair Griffiths, our CBC film cameraman from Vancouver, British Columbia. When uh, the expedition leader heard that Blair had been killed, he said, that's it, four men killed in three days. He says, it's, it's everybody off. Don't even bring Blair's body down. It's too dangerous, just get everybody off. So in the act of coming off the mountain, we did bring Blair's body down. We knew that if it stayed up there, we'd never find it again, and it was visible. So against the expedition leader's orders, we did bring, bring Blair down off the mountain. In the process, three more men were injured, two Sherpas and myself. I broke three ribs on my right side, was taped up, thrown into a tent where I would lie for two weeks. The other mobile members of our team carried Blair down to that village of Dugla where he was cremated. And then they came back to base camp. It was about eight kilometers away. On the way back, seven men decided the risk for them didn't balance against the reward. They decided to leave the expedition and they would leave the following day and head back to Canada. The rest of the team got together for a meeting, looked at the equipment and gear that we had carried up to the site of Camp One and realized we couldn't justify any more carries. If we were to do this, we had to do it with what gear was already up there at Camp One. So the route that we came to do, the southwest face of Everest, was impractical with the amount of human resources and hard resources we had so we applied to the Nepali government for a change of route. So, while waiting for that change of route, a storm kept us trapped in base camp for about 12 days. The day it cleared, we got approval to go back on the mountain. I had the bandages removed from my chest by the Camp Zetas, Dave Reed, and uh, I still couldn't inflate my right lung. So the one doctor we had said, I can't let you back on the mountain. I need you to go to a hospital and get an x-ray. There was one six, seven days away back in Namche Bazaar. So he said, get going. So I packed the bag up and I took off. Meanwhile, the other members reopened the route from base camp to camp one, pulling out rope from, in some places, six, seven feet of snow that it was buried underneath, fishing for bridges that had collapsed and fallen back down into crevasses where the crevasses had opened up and on the right side, twisting ladders like a piece of licorice when they closed up. And eventually they got across these crevasses and reestablished camp one. I would get to the hospital in four days, the same day the x-ray machine broke. I had them examine me, they said, you got broken ribs, I said, thank you. And then I got ready to head back. But I heard uh, a rumor that a Canadian woman had arrived at Namche, and it was uh, Dwayne's girlfriend, Colleen Campbell. In the middle of the night I found her, and then she would accompany me back up to base camp. And as we were walking in over the next few days, she was able to raise base camp on the radio. I didn't believe you could reach it as far away as we were. And I talked to Peter Spear and he said, if you want to go up, Laura, you better get back here quick. Bill's closing the ice ball. So I left Colleen behind and I headed off. I got there as quick as I could. And then I was told, ah, you missed it, Laura. It's shut down. The ice ball is closed. Bill doesn't want anyone to go up. I said, yeah, oh, okay. And then I packed my stuff up, and then the, a radio call came in. They said, Laurie, it's for you. And it was Bill March. And he was saying, I don't want you coming up. <laughs> I turned the radio off, and then I got my stuff organized. And then he called down again and talked to the base camp manager and said, if Laurie doesn't follow what I'm instructing, nobody is to go with him. Um, yeah, okay. So I got all the mail for the guys. I got batteries, and I headed off. And it wasn't 
because all oh, the doctors said, well, what did they say? I said, I got the x-rays. It's all okay. It's all healed really well. And the, the idea wasn't about doing something. The, the idea was this, that I knew I hadn't come to Everest to sit in base camp. That wasn't what it was about. And I didn't know how it would unfold, but I knew I was supposed to be up on the mountain. And so I went up through the ice ball. Two Sherpas followed me to the turnaround point. And then they, they were crying when they said goodbye to me because they thought I was going to die. And then I, I went on. And uh, are we pulling it up? Thanks. Are you going to get to that image? I'll let you find it. And uh, I started climbing till I got to a place where the... Uh, are you okay? <laughs> Try slide 60. I, I, Go to slide 60. I'm more ADHD. I climbed until I got to a bridge that was broken. And uh, the crevasse had separated and the bridge had pulled back so that it was... The end of the ladder was six to seven feet from the edge of the crevasse. It's about 200 feet deep. And I looked at it. I couldn't get across. So then I spent an hour and a half searching left, right, around, until I realized there was no, there was no way across. And so I reluctantly turned around and I started down. And as I started down, I, uh, it was quiet for about five to ten minutes. I could just hear the crunch of my boots in the snow. And then I heard a voice, <laughs> and the voice said, was, is that the best you could do? And <laughs> the answer was, well, yeah, that's the best. I mean, anything more would be too dangerous. And then I got down about another three minutes, and then I heard the voice go, was that more than your best? And I answered honestly, and the honest answer was, well, no, more than my best would be to go back up, rig the ropes as best I could, and try to jump from the end of the bridge to try to make it to the other side. And I couldn't believe it, but I remember that that was what I said my intention was on Everest, was to to do more than my best every day of the trip. So I turned around and I headed back up. I got up there, I looked at the same scenario. It was a plastic rope from one side to the other that had stretched, it wouldn't hold my weight if I fell. So I rigged a dead man up, put an anchor in the snow with a climbing rope, backed myself up, gave myself 12 to 14 feet of slack, put a pencil ascender on my harness, crawled to the end of the ladder, it was like a diving board, stood there, looked at the 200 foot drop, looked at the other side, and then I, I sprung off the ladder and I, I threw myself at the other side. I got my ice axe in with my left hand, because I'm left handed, I got my left foot kicked into the ice and my right hand was clawing at the, the, the edge of snow on the edge of the glacier while I tried to flick my right leg up. And the problem was it was the right side that my ribs are broken on, so it was just killing me as I tried to flip my leg up. And uh, eventually I did get my right leg up and hooked my toe into the snow and was able to pull my body up and roll over the edge. And I lay there panting and breathing heavily for about three, four minutes. And then when I opened my eyes, yeah, back a little bit. Just need to go back a bit. Oh, you still figured out how to make it into the slideshow, okay. Uh, as I opened my eyes, I noticed that everything had, uh, Sorry, oh, you want me to? Can anybody help me with Windows 2000? Slideshow, right up there, yeah? See, I'm not as bad as looking. You want me to do it? Does anybody work in IT? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work in the Somehow I don't think the glasses are actually good You know what? Slideshow tools, format, file, edit, view, right view. Real 
So the point I'm trying to make is that when I opened my eyes, I noticed that everything had changed. And it's uh, for those of you that haven't done any ayahuasca or San Pedro, San Pedro attorneys, you may not know what I'm talking about, but reality had shifted. And I looked at the sky and it was a different color. I looked at the ice crystals, it was a different color. And in retrospect, as I look back, I realized that if I hadn't made the jump from the end of that ladder, my reality now would be quite different. And I realized something had changed. And I felt this calmness inside and, and like a reassurance that as long as I kept trying to do more than my best each day, that things would actually unfold okay. And then it was with that thought that I picked up my bag, I pulled it from the other side, it was attached with a long rope, and then I started up. And then I joined uh, two Canadians and three Sherpas at Camp One. We started carrying gear, the remainder of the gear, and dismantling bridges up to Camp Two. So I would carry part way and go back down and get another load because I wasn't looking forward to meeting Bill March. And then eventually, <laughs> we had changed our plan.